Hello, world. You are listening to Feel Good with your host, Malika Lee, on 105.7 KVRU FM LP. Today, my guest is Bob Ness, who is the principal of Ness Consulting, as well as the chair of Global Leadership Forum. And we will be talking today about race in America, specifically white privilege, white male privilege. I think there's a distinction. And um, what other wonderful topics come up in our conversation together? Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you, Malika. Yeah, I'm it's so great to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you too. And uh, for my listeners, some of you may be wondering why are we talking about such topics uh, on a show in, intended for people to feel good and. You know, my my consideration or offering is that we can feel good and be real and be honest and not have our head in the clouds about things that are going on. And sometimes it can be a delicate balance. What are your thoughts on that, Bob? Well, I think that if you're, if there's no no reason you can't be both real and have a good time at it. So I'm looking forward to a good time with you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right, so I mentioned, um, so for our listeners, we will talk about some juicy things that may not really happen in public forums as far as like white guilt. We've talked about white privilege. So sit back, relax, and, and enjoy this ride with us. So, Bob, I mentioned a little bit earlier in your introduction that you are chair of the Global Leadership Forum. Will you tell us a little bit more about what that is? So it's an eight-year-old organization that supports leaders of primarily U.S.-based um, international development organizations. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's to help them make their organizations more effective and their leadership more effective. Okay, and how long have you been involved with the organization? Um, I started with a colleague, Peter Bloomquist, about eight years ago. Oh, so you were there from the very beginning. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Well, I'd, I have been working with leadership uh, groups like Leadership Tomorrow for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that there were no organizations that were really focused on assisting organizations working globally. And we have quite a number of them in our area. So that's when I decided to start. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, oh, there's so many ways we can go with that. I'm going to hold back for now. <laughs> Okay. And and um, <laughs> hold and back, ask, Malika. Yes, I'm going to hold back, and I'm going to ask you what matters to you. So we've talked a little bit about what you do, but what matters to you, Bob? So the question of what matters is, I guess, akin to asking, "What's my mission?" Okay. Yes. So many people develop a personal mission statement, mm -hmm. and mine is to be of service. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a pretty broad kind of mission statement, but um, one that I've tried to act out mm -hmm. over a good portion of my life. So I think a rewarding life is a life of service. I would agree with you there. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, so let's get into the, the race talk in, in America. Okay. Let's right. let's jump right in there. With, all right. So how would you, first of all, for our listeners, I don't want to make an assumption that people believe that white privilege exists. So that's my first question to you, Bob. Do you think that white privilege exists? So um, we haven't delved into exactly what is white privilege or how do I perceive it. Okay. But uh, let me just say that it first came to me as a phrase mm -hmm. and something that I needed to understand probably 15 to 18 years ago. Okay. Something like that. And Bob, you cannot have you don't have the luxury of seeing him like I do. Bob Ness is a a, a white older gentleman. Um, I am an African American woman. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a poster child of a, a, an older white male. I'm 73 years old. Mm -hmm. I have silver gray hair. Yes. I have blue eyes. I have a Northern European uh, heritage. Okay. Okay. And I I do not uh, look younger than I I really am. So I say I'm 85. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I definitely I think do not have. Um, well, ageism for women works differently. I was going to say I don't know if I have age on my side, but in some ways, looking youthful does mean that age is on my on my side because we mentioned your age, and generally, a distinguished as men age is considered distinguished, and you get even more respect usually. Uh, in some uh, not instances, necessarily. no, not oh, look, this is another. No, I, th I think we're in a changing time. I think we're mm -hmm. in a time where uh, male white privilege or or the stereotype of male white privilege mm -hmm. is under attack and assault in good ways, actually. 
but uh, the assumption that uh, somebody that looks like me is and people people have said to me um, you know why don't you run for office Bob? <laughs> <laughs> You got the you've got the right look. You know you you have the gravitas. Yes. You have the, you have the something and the charm and uh, no, charisma. No, I don't have that. But I yeah. would disagree with anyway, you. Anyway, so but just from an appearance standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, people have said that to me unsolicited. So where does that come from? Right, and that goes back to that initial question. So you were saying about fifteen to eighteen years ago, you heard this term. Yeah, so we that we had a we were doing an exercise in a leadership tomorrow class on the topic of white privilege, and the exercise has questions, and, mm -hmm. and as you answer the questions, you are asked to either step forward or step back in a group. And after the questions are done, you you can see that there are a group of white people people in the middle, and a people people of color on the outer concentric circle, and uh, there are questions like. Have you ever been followed in a store? Uh, do, do you, are you concerned at all about uh, approaching a policeman? Uh, do, do you think they will be favorably inclined to help you? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I think I was quite, what? I, I don't think I was unaware of my own racism or that of others when we did that. Mm -hmm. But it was very... Uh, a demonstrable way of seeing that in evidence there in that group that there was disparity there was disparity mm -hmm. and um, as as I have continued to explore the idea of white privilege there are elements of what it means I think to me um, so for example I wake up in the morning and I am not concerned about my race Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not getting it up. I'm I, let's say if I have an appointment for um, going in to, to try to get a job. Mm -hmm. I am not concerned about that aspect of how I'm going to be received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a privilege. Yes. Well, I've had conversations of race with high school people that I went to high school with. Mm -hmm. And and um, the people of color that I've talked to have. um admitted to me that they were treated differently mm -hmm. and uh, so we've, we've had some good conversations about that but hard hard to talk about yeah it can be very uncomfortable and so I want to thank you again for mm -hmm. accepting my invitation to come on the show and to talk about race in America yeah and so okay so let's and we so you've answered my question by saying yes there is a difference and there is a privilege where you're not thinking about your race or how you will be perceived and received so how would you define white privilege well, or describe well, it well uh, okay so there are dimensions like uh, institutional racism mm -hmm. so so there are aspects of the way the system is currently practiced mm -hmm. that favor um, white people. Yeah. Yeah, so that's white privilege. And I would say... I and was... it's unearned. And it's unearned. So, so yeah. So it's not it's not a matter of... So, you know, the many white folk mm -hmm. have a challenge trying to think of, well, what have I done to deserve hmm, anybody questioning my ra my beliefs or, or whether I'm racist or not? Mm -hmm. why, why should I... My relatives, in oh, I can just say for myself, my relatives, uh, many of them came from Norway, mm -hmm. about three quarters and another quarter of mixed heritage. Yes. Uh, but they, di they didn't own slaves. Mm -hmm. They didn't intentionally practice, mm, from what I knew anyway, anything that was negative toward other people because of color. Right. So then why would somebody say to me, you've got white privilege, mm -hmm. right? And again, the answer is there's an advantage that's there that's unearned. Yes. And, you know, I was thinking about this. There's there's so many great things that you said. And, and one of them that captures, I was like, what is this thing with white privilege? What would I say as a African-American woman yeah. is white privilege? And and one of them was to, to your point about not earning something. So it's like you're given the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Off the bat. 
that you're capable, right? That you're um, intelligent, <clears throat> um, and like when you're saying about not earning it, whereas other other ethnic ethnicities may experience where you're not given that benefit of the doubt, right? That you're more honest. If we go into the the experience that some people have of being followed in the stores. Mm. Um, so, so that's part of the, the underlying. And I think the other part that's more subtle, especially as a graduate of a historically black college, shout out to Spelman College, Atlanta, Georgia, there you go, Spelman. yes, is, is, you know, humans, as though as sophisticated as we like to believe we are, we are still species and we are a tribal species. And so there's also this sense of belonging that I think is a privilege and being in the Northwest it's like some the quickest way to see if we belong sometimes is based on do people look like us in the spaces that we are in. Mm -hmm. And I think a subtle aspect of it is going into a lot of spaces up here in the Northwest and not seeing a lot of reflections back of a lot of other people that look like us in the spaces, mm -hmm. whether it's in a corporate environment, sometimes in our neighborhoods, et cetera. What do you think about, about that as part of the privilege is just having people that look like you around you, especially in places that you want to be in, employment, for example, education. So I think um, <clears throat> I think the roots of this are partly in the roots of, uh, of se segregation. Mm -hmm. Because let's say if, if I don't know anyone who is not like me. Yes. And if I'm not curious, I can just go about my business. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so... You know, if I'm if I'm in an all, almost all white community, mm -hmm. and I think most urban communities aren't that description, but even so, um, it's really easy for a white person to just not be thinking about it, right? Right. And and so if you don't have a personal experience. Mm -hmm with a person from a different ethnic then you then you're really well on the on so there's the scale you know of unconsciously incompetent <laughs> okay that's you don't know what you don't know mm -hmm. and then there's the consciously competent mm -hmm. and that's when you know you really don't know because you've been woken up mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and then there's the conscious competence that's when you work hard to be competent yes and then there's the unconscious competence when you don't need to work hard at it because you become competent. Mm -hmm. And there are quite a few people that are unconsciously competent about race altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting um, because even there's a subtlety sometimes where, where sometimes an experience of a person who says, I feel like I'm treated differently is not honored like there is this guy who was talking about white privilege and he's a white guy and he's like look i'm not the expert of white privilege but but he was like everything you hear today will be from uh, somebody else that i've talked to that's a person of color you're not going to hear anything that is new that i have come up with he said but even that i'm the one being invited to these colleges to talk about white privilege is the very essence of white privilege in the sense of you know, if I say it or if someone of color says that it exists, sometimes it's not taken as, as credible as if someone that looks like you says it or acknowledges that. I think that's right. And I think the media has been dominated for a long time now mm -hmm. in ways that have, getting, have given, a, uh, given more credibility to mm -hmm. certain kinds of media that it's controlled by a certain group of people mm -hmm. so you know do you what what, where, what do you think is where should you get your news that you trust <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a tough question <laughs> to answer these days yeah i think it's so interesting going back to the optics let's say with history which is an indoctrination in this country anyway you know forming these young minds if we look at those American history, how it's told through those lenses, really the contributions that are worth documenting have only been by white men primarily. We've heard about Dr. King. We hear a bit about like, you know, the women's suffrage movement, but there's a lot of, you know, elements to, to um, what we're taught in school 
or not taught. <laughs> I think that that molds our minds unconsciously and consciously. And people are still saying Christopher Columbus discovered America. <laughs> well, they are. Yes, they are. <clears throat> but there were people here. But there were people here. And he thought he was in India. Yeah. So why? I mean, and it's not that you're in education, but it's just this wondering of why do we continue? What is the value in perpetuating these stories that are half truths, if there are any truth in them at all? Well, that particular myth supports uh, uh, a variety of Asian or of uh, European Americans mm -hmm. who uh, and their vision of themselves as explorers and finding new dimensions, new pathways, and being innovative, and mm -hmm. and and it's a wonderful self-concept to have, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you fit into but that. But it, it also supports the denial of Native American culture and how vibrant they are still in this country. And, and I think that, I, I don't think there's a separation, or I think that by not including accurately the contributions of many types of ethnicities in this country, I think that that's kind of given rise to this whole, what's it called, xenophobia, this whole mm -hmm. thing about immigration when we're, except for the natives, that we're all immigrants. And it's like there's been such great contributions by people um, that we have all come here. Now, you know, people of, of uh, African descent, myself included, would say, I'm, I don't know if I'm an immigrant per se because I didn't, our ancestors didn't willingly come here. No. Um, Forced immigration. Right. Right. But, but I think perhaps immigration might be perceived a little bit differently if there was a more accurate tapestry in our history books and, and foundation of the other contributions uh, made by people of, of many different um, ethnicities. Curriculum makes a real difference. It mm -hmm. can make a real difference. I remember I had, in uh, grade school, I had a, a book that had George Washington Carver as one of the heroes. Oh, Famous cool. Famous botanist. Yes. African-American botanist. I know who he is. You know, and, and, uh, and he was the only scientist that I knew of, of African descent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but, but, it, but he became a hero of mine. So... You know, I've also had some very different experiences about about race. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for Are a while. Are you willing to share your experience at Spelman that you told me about? Oh, sure. I, this curriculum in the course that's required your fresh woman year is called African Diaspora and the World. What we did explore things like patriarchy and you know, mech, sexism, racism, uh, classism ageism, colorism, and how all of these things have, these uh, ideologies have been spread all around the world because of colonization. Mm -hmm. And so the thread and really the nugget I took away from that experience, one, was becoming consciously aware of the messaging that, that um, I was being offered growing up that a lot of times, you know, I'm not really thinking about it or I wasn't then. And the, and the second takeaway that I got from that, which was huge, was that my experience as a growing up as an, a woman of African descent in Seattle, Washington, wasn't so different as, you know, a, a young woman of African descent growing up in Haiti mm -hmm. um, or growing up in, in Kenya or, you know, in all of these respective places because the sexism and all those other things <laughs> were present in their environments, just like it was present in mine. And so, you know, minus necessarily, you know, like the racism, for example. But, but it was just really fascinating in some ways to kind of have the veil lifted from my eyes um, about that. Yes. And so you learned all these things that you had in common with your classmates. Well, my classmates and my and my sisters of the, uh -huh. the diaspora yeah. of whom yeah, I may yeah. never meet. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it kind of strengthened a sisterhood. Um, and then beyond that, as I've grown older, you know, I've gone to some um, like life coaching type <laughs> intensives and boot camps. And I think one of the greatest gifts of those experiences is that when we pull back the masks, it's like we're all really dealing with the same things. Mm. We're all dealing with wondering, you know, if we were good enough, <laughs> you know, feeling like we may not have been loved or accepted fully by a parent. Mm. You know, these are things that that transcend our outer shell that we're all dealing with. And that was a wonderful gift because I remember 
specifically people get up and share their personal stories. You got me talking now, Bob, mm-hmm. but people get up and share their personal <laughs> stories. And I remember there's this man who looked like a stereotypical, let's say motorcycle, you know, motorcycle gang type character. So this kind of burly uh, white guy, leather jacket, right? Long hair, some facial hair. And um, he gets up to the mic to start talking and share his story. And I was like, oh, my God, he's telling my story. Hmm. And that really struck which, me. Which parts did he Oh, did, gosh, did Bob, it's been so to? long. It's been so long ago. I think the biggest resonance was how much we had in common, despite how differently we physically looked. Hmm. Um, maybe his feelings of not belonging, uh-huh. of, of um, you know, questioning his own worth and value or feeling mm. loved or treated, you know, so it was like the same kind of themes that I really think that we all are dealing with on some level at some point in time in our lives. So, so yeah, that, that graduated me in my early twenties to like really recognizing my, my role and my part in the human family. I, I think we've, we've set a foundation of does white privilege exist in this country? The reason why I opened up the idea of like white male privilege, and I think there's a subtle distinction is, you know, our political arena, um, I think has amplified things in a way that when you're saying there's, there's an opportunity sometimes depending on where you live as a white person not to have to interact with other types of people mm-hmm. and i think our political uh, playground in this country kind of amplifies certain aspects of our bias and i personally thought that there were certain things that hillary rodham clinton as a candidate experienced as a white woman that a male counterpart may not have experienced and so that's why i made that distinction as well as historically Black men were given the privilege to vote in this country before white women were. And so um, I don't know if there's for you any distinctions that you make between white privilege and like the white male privilege. Have you thought about it at all? Well, uh, sure. I mean, uh, if you're talking about within a particular ethnic group, let's say within white society, Mm -hmm. um, I think there's an obvious gender gap in lots of different ways and and I think we've made some progress with that over time but it's Mm -hmm. still there's still a gender gap Mm -hmm. so if you combine gender with race you're going to get kind of a double whammy okay right yeah so I I recall when my just on the personal side Mm -hmm. my my mother told me after my father had passed that um, she had wanted to go to college Mm -hmm. And she'd been to business school, and my father hadn't been to college. Uh, He he was an artist, and among other things. But he he didn't want her to go to college. Mm. He said, no, I don't think you need that. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, you've got to be kidding me. My father was actually not enhancing my mother's ability to develop as a person. Hmm. And I, I never had heard that up until, you know, just a few years ago. So I think there are, you know, those kinds of unconscious biases. Mm-hmm. And then you have c- cultural dimensions. If you, you know, if we look globally, you take uh, an, or- an organization that works there called Sahar, has educated several hundred thousand young women mm-hmm. and who otherwise would not have received an education probably because there's a bias against women having education in that society and a bias for marrying early. So that's that's a tough one. Yes, it's it's so complex. It can be. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Bob, because I've known you for some time now, and I would consider you to be very interested in in causes, in people. Uh, you mentioned service being one of your is part of your mission that don't look like you. Yeah. And so I'm wondering. You know, I know a little bit about you. You were born. <laughs> And grew we have up in, done a couple things. Yes, we have. Together, we right? have, and and you grew up in Oregon, which I would not consider a very diverse area. So I'm just curious because the, I think the other part of privilege is being able to opt out, mm-hmm. being able to opt out of different of you know even having a conversation or experience of race. I think sometimes people, if you don't want to have that conversation, you can walk out of the room 
but but those you know people of color can say well i don't want to talk about but i might experience it day to day mm -hmm. so so why are you interested or when did this journey start of really um being engaged in a lot of cultural and ethnic um interest or groups so I, i'd credit my mother with being a, a person of high curiosity <laughs> who could talk to anyone okay. so i had a model there mm -hmm. uh, at age 17 i went to live in japan uh, through uh, an experimental program where I was a freshman in college there and uh, I came in you know I was completely immersed in a different culture mm -hmm. and that's when I think my journey began in terms of my curiosity about cross-cultural understanding and uh, and where were the differences and where were the similarities and where were there where were you absolutely the same yes yeah and uh, you know and I the people around me when I returned from Japan, for example, they would say, oh, and they would give me stereotypes about Japanese or Japanese Americans, for mm -hmm. that matter. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't show much emotion. Well, my Japanese family cried when I left. Oh. And so it's like there were so many opportunities that I had. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the privilege that I had mm -hmm. to travel. Yes. Who, who who has the privilege to travel? Well, our, our country has... Yes, right. It's, a lot, a lot. Even, even across the the entire country, uh, we the Americans travel a lot. It's globally. Yes, right? it's it's true, and and um, and up there's until some over, recently, there's some overlap, I think, between white privilege fear. and American privilege, and, oh, but without fear, right? Mm -hmm. Up until recently. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, there's there's some similarities when I traveled traveled abroad that I noticed. I was like, oh, American privilege. There's, there's some similarities in the sense of, you know, with white privilege, it's like other people know more about you in this country, usually white people, than you, you know about them. Mm -hmm. I found traveling abroad, they knew way more about American politics mm -hmm. than I knew about what was going on in their respective countries. Mm -hmm. Generally, they communicated with me in a way that was in my native tongue or in my aptitude to communicate, which is English. Mm -hmm. Um and there's one more that's escaping me right now, but I oh that I could go anywhere that I that I wanted to go. Right. And some in some respects to your point about the passport, and I didn't realize that was a luxury until I became a really good friend with a Ghanaian woman, and she was telling me like you know how difficult it was to get into this country. Well, is it not a privilege to be able to behave as you wish mm -hmm. when you are the minority in another country traveling as a guest? <laughs> is it not? Do people think that they're guests? I guess that's the well. That's the they part. may not. Uh, you know, I, I I was in Myanmar last year, and mm -hmm. um, I saw a famous actor um, who uh, just totally violated all the norms of this particular Buddhist culture mm -hmm. and got in the way of monks and was obviously not sensitive. I mean, that's the kind of boorishness that we try to avoid as people who are trying to be sensitive as they travel cross-culturally, mm -hmm. but it's very common. And it, it's common not just with Americans, it's common with others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. about not sitting back and just kind of observing maybe yeah. and understanding the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked about, and you know we've talked about, you know, these disparities, but I want to just say very frankly that I really think race is a social construct it based is. based upon you know in my humble opinion especially i'm coming from an economics background mm -hmm. on a justification of enslavement <laughs> you know and, and, and enslaving people and treating them very inhumanely and to justify maybe on on a some kind of psychological level uh this treatment by saying that they weren't people i think you have to do that as a human being in order to do what was done to people who were enslaved Absolutely. So you have to diminish their humanity, and it was done historically by using the Bible mm -hmm. and oh, other. Oh yeah. So science, they 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 tried to justify it in many science many was, realms. Was distorted to, you know, I mean, modern genetic scientists mm -hmm. has traces our ancestors to Africa. Absolutely. And I went to the race exhibit at the Pacific Science Center. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I'd seen on a PBS documentary, and it just drove it home there, was um, two things. One was that we are 
it's like nine blank, 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 the same mm -hmm. genetically, mm -hmm. regardless of our skin color. Mm -hmm. And and that there was so many DNA strands, you know, on that globe, there was this global mat that they had on the on the floor and they showed all these DNA strands and how all of them, except for a very small percentage, all had some overlap uh, in the continent of Africa. Do you remember that part? I do. And so it's so powerful in the sense of you know, how we can convince ourselves, even with what is reality, quote unquote, uh, with like this quantum physics is that whatever we believe is true, is true for us. What do you think about that? Well, at the root of um, racism toward African Americans, I think is the fear of talking about slavery. Mm -hmm. Talking about slavery means that somebody is account should be held accountable. If you read the personal descriptions of what slavery was like yes. for African Americans, somebody should have to pay for that. So the the, the notion of the of reparations, mm -hmm. which usually in most people's mind means financial reparations. Mm -hmm. In other words, payment back for being mistreated. Um, I, I think it's a very, very difficult conversation because, again, white Americans don't think, by and large, if they didn't participate in slavery, that they have any responsibility there. Oh, this is this is getting juicy. So if I if I'm a white American whose family may have participated by in slavery by being slave owners, what is my responsibility? Would be one question that mm -hmm. they might have. Mm -hmm. But if I as I am, a third-generation, primarily Norwegian-American, whose family did not have slaves, what responsibility do I have? Are they different? I would say they are. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, because of white privilege, I have enjoyed some of the benefits of being part of white American, I'll use the word culture, but I use it loosely. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I am actually an advocate of the conversation about mm -hmm. reparations because I think we haven't had an honor, honest conversation about slavery. There's so much guilt associated mm -hmm. with it when you get to yes. it. Yes. And, uh, and the, you know, you'll hear pe people talk about the slave trade and they say, oh, well, Africans, you know, traded their own kind or, they, you know, they traded their own tribe members. Yes. They did this, they did that. That was in my history book and, from Copyright well, 1963. And, and so therefore it was... It, so they're culpable? So it's okay. It's okay. That's what they're trying to justify. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So reparations conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm for it. Interesting. I didn't know this about you. And there have been other groups, right? Were they Did they call them reparations for those that were in the Japanese internment camps? There, there were words like that used when to, uh, in the internment camps, camps for Japanese Americans who were interned um, during World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, there, um, the subsequent conversations ended up, as you know, with some very small financial rewards for anybody who was offended, or I don't mean offended in a light way. Right. I mean, who was hurt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there was an apology. Mm -hmm. That apology. It's about the one by has, President Bill Clinton yeah, at the time? The yes. apology has not been made to African Americans. Mm. Oh, I thought Bill Clinton did apologize. It's not in a way that the conversation, I, I don't believe that the real conversation, that a real conversation in the country took place. I would agree with you on, so, on that point. So, so until the real conversation about what happened mm -hmm. occurs mm -hmm. in a way that you could say there, there was a support yes. for an apology. So this there's so many facets to go with this because one of the things that... Um, comes to mind and is a form of the denial of it is like this whole thing that you touched upon of white guilt. Yeah. And so if you're an advocate for reparations, I'm just wondering if you've had these conversations with with men that look like you and what their responses <laughs> have been. I have had mm -hmm. with some. Uh, I haven't had it with uh, Ku Klux Klan members. Okay. Uh, I've had it with men or women that... Mm -hmm. I would say are more open to are 
uh, trying to become educated about their own racism or mm -hmm. the role that racism has played in this country. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And so they that I've had. that that you've had, and so they've been open for, and and I think reparations and acknowledgement in that way is important as well as do you think because i think underlying that if i look at what happened in south africa mm -hmm. and they had those trials after you know uh former president nelson mandela was elected mm -hmm. where people got a chance to speak their truths and i really feel like there was a lot of healing that happened and would you suggest part of me is like okay we can do the reparations and do you think that that would move along on some level the deeper acknowledgement of the of the issues with slavery is that your like i said i'm saying i'm after the reparations conversation okay it is the conversation it's the telling of the story mm -hmm. it's the admitting of culpability mm -hmm. that goes toward forgiveness and so for those whether that... that's in rwanda or whether it's in south africa or yeah. whether it's here so then for for those going back to like to 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 white guilt bob and they say well that was my those were my ancestors. I didn't have any part to that. What do you say to them when they raise that issue? Again, I would say you have the benefits in, in being part of the dominant culture, mm -hmm. the, the over, over culture. Uh, you have white privilege. And so you are, you didn't, you didn't do anything for that again, back to that. Did you do anything to, to, really deserve your mm -hmm. position in society. So the Monopoly board is set up, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> right. And I think some people don't think it's set up anymore, that it's that it's balanced. I'm just playing an, uh, a contrarian in this sense. Um, and for those I, listeners that I, may be I, thinking that. Again, I, I, I think any person would have to acknowledge there have been advances, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, to equity and inclusion and, and diversity. Mm -hmm. I think... There have been advances, so mm -hmm. there's reason for hope. Yes. But to say that we're there, no. Yeah. So from your opinion, what would what would there look like for you? Wow. I know. That's a big dream. Mm-hmm. Um I've been I've been with so if we're talking only only racism. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the disparity of how, particularly psychologically, people have to live wouldn't be there. So yeah, if I were African American, I wouldn't have to wake up and worry about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. How I'm treated, microaggression, whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I would be able to be a fully integrated member of society with all of the options in front of me. Mm -hmm. That's what the dream would be. Yeah. And I think living in the Northwest, one of the things that um, I I would like to say, I, I don't, this might be a little controversial, but I, I kind of consider, consider a lot of people pseudo-liberals up here, mm -hmm. but they don't know that they're pseudo mm -hmm. um, in the sense that I think sometimes it's more dangerous to say you don't see color or don't have any bias than to acknowledge that their biases. Like I, I can say that I had a job for a number of years working with all different types of people. And there were some people based on their disposition, how they carried themselves, maybe what they had on, like all of that. And I would notice that I had a judgment about them. Mm -hmm. And um, and I made an intention not to treat them any differently, but I did notice that I would have a judgment. And I think sometimes with with what I've experienced up here, it's that there's not even an acknowledgement sometimes that a person has a bias, which I find like, well, if we don't have a, if there's not even a foundation for there to be growth, then it's like, well, I don't need to work on that because that's not an issue for me. Sure. Yeah. Well, to say that I'm a racist, that that's a hard thing for a white person to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not all about admitting guilt. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about admitting there's a institutional process that's been in place that has produced certain kinds of ideas about others. Mm -hmm. So, but I think the denial that there are still racist thoughts and beliefs and, mm -hmm. and, and not even conscious. Mm -hmm. 
Right. For many people. Uh, that, that's just uh, a denial of reality. Have you experienced your own? I have. Well, can you share more about what that was like for you? Um, sure. Um, I think, it, again, it's an entering a space in which you feel unfamiliar in particular, mm -hmm. or I do. Mm -hmm. So let's say I, I enter into a space that's... Can we bring it tangible? All African-American men. Okay. And you've, that's happened to you before? Sure. Okay. So some of my experience like that has been extremely positive and, and, I, and I haven't been concerned. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll give a specific example. So <clears throat> during the early 70s, I went to the Malcolm X Center in Tacoma, Washington uh, with a friend of mine, a uh, colleague, co-director of the Tacoma Crisis Clinic, a fellow named Bill Hall. And oh yes, Bill, yeah, he's a great act actor. actor. Yeah, yes, yeah, and and Bill uh, Bill was introducing me around, and they were about to put on a play at the center, and um, and I was being asked to play a white drug dealer in the black community. <laughs> oh, and I said I don't think I want to do this. Uh -huh. I didn't say it out loud. Uh huh. But I didn't want to. Okay. And uh, and a young man pulled out a gun. And put it in my face and said, you're going to play that role. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, no, I'm telling you the truth. And so, and Bill defended me. And, you know, we were. This we was got, a fellow actor that pulled, and this no, is no, a no, real no. gun? It, it wasn't an actor. It oh, was okay. a member of the community at the time. Okay. And this was a, it was a time of very heightened race uh, relations. This so, is in the 70s, you said, yeah, right? Yeah, early 70s. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I have that experience, but mm -hmm. then I have. Lots of other experiences where I'm the only person of non-color. Right. And so, uh, but I think well, the question, the, the there are triggers that, that can cause you to think, well, okay, is this a dangerous situation or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think many white people are triggered by group of young black men standing on a corner mm -hmm. and saying, should I go up and approach these guys, for example? Mm -hmm. or, am I likely to be safe or am I, is this likely to be dangerous? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the reverse can also be true. Yeah. And well, in criminalizing, you know, African-American men, that started, you know, way back. Mm -hmm. um, and so like we were talking about earlier, it's in our, in our psyche uh, in some ways as a country. Mm-hmm. And so how do you, when you become aware of such thoughts, what do you, what steps, so if someone's listening and they say, you know, I've had this experience also, I've clutched my purse or I was afraid, um, what, what would, can you walk them through how you handle that now when it comes up? Yeah. So, so I just take a minute and reflect on what's going on with me that's going on. Is, is there, is this reality or am I, am I being triggered by something that is deeper, you know, in terms of some early training Mm -hmm. Or in terms of some kind of racist attitude that I've internalized. Okay. So that's what I do internally, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you didn't I, get out the car yet. Like <laughs> you didn't get out the car yet. So are then, you still in the car and you see these? <laughs> and then I then I acknowledge whatever, whichever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But how do you know whichever uh, it is? Oh, like if there's a real or is it just a perceived like threat or danger? I usually test, yeah. How do you test? I might start a conversation, but I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm an, I'm an extrovert. <laughs> yes, yes, we, I know, yeah. yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So you might test it it's and just say It's going to depend on the context, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and so, because I want to bring it, uh, we just have a, a couple minutes left, but to bring it on home, so then you test, you might strike up a conversation and see if they're receptive to you or not. And then if they are not receptive, how have you handled that? Do you get back in your car and leave or? Depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, again, you know, I've been in, I've had the, again, privilege. Right. Of tra widespread travel over 50 countries. Mm -hmm. Lots of cultures. Lots of dangerous situations too. Mm -hmm. Wartime included. Uh, so, so I think you, one tries to judge what, what, whether any danger is real or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a very primal thing is survival, right? right. There was a, a book I'm just going to touch on very lightly, but it's called The Wisdom of Your Dreams. Hmm. And it was so interesting. There's one chapter that really took me by surprise where he talks about prejudice and racism. Mm -hmm. The author was, a, a, I think, a, a Methodist preacher, white guy, mm -hmm. and was doing some civil rights work in a uh, African-American community. And the long story short of it is that he rounded up some well-intentioned white people where things didn't go well with their work in the community, and they did dream work together hmm. and and really had an opportunity to work th through their own unconscious bias through addressing these dreams. So for those that um, are also curious about whether their bias is around racial lines or gender lines, mm -hmm. um, that book is a very fascinating like entryway mm -hmm. into our inner exploration mm -hmm. um, of our own bias and projection on other people. What would you suggest, how would one get started with becoming a bit more, increasing their aptitude? Well, I think by being respectfully curious. Mm -hmm. So I think most people respond to that. Do you mind if I ask you something about this? Okay. So being respectfully curious about that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, put yourself in the position of being not with people that you're comfortable with. Mm. Okay, what could that look like? What do you suggest? Well, I spent last weekend in a Native American... Sweat lodge. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a comfortable thing for me to even think about doing initially, but it was it was something that I decided I wanted to do because a friend of mine was a member of that particular tribe, mm -hmm. and I wanted to experience what he had invited me to experience. And how has that that added value to your life? Because you know, like we said, it's a privilege, and you can opt in or opt out. So why would someone want to? Because what... there's a rich there's a richness of culture there that that just has brought me a lot of new awareness about Native American traditions mm -hmm. and how alive they are um, and how vibrant and how useful they are to anybody who chooses to be a part of that and, and understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and we're living in a small world now where we, whether we like it or not, we're going to continue to be in touch with people from all over the planet. <laughs> and we, yes. And without understanding their cultures, their norms, their worries, the kinds of things that make them tick, their traditions, you, you're not going to be able to operate effectively. So from, if, even, if, even if you wanted to just take it from a purely pragmatic, I'd like to be more effective in the world, mm -hmm. that it, curiosity would be a good way to help you get there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. An open mind, a curious mind. I would say it's interesting as a as a woman who has diverse friends. Um, sometimes it's you know as a person of color in those situations, it's like I don't want to be the spokesperson for you know my people. Well, I don't want. <laughs> I don't want to be the spokesperson for my people either. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's but it seems that in those conversations and and I went to a, a wonderful conversation about race and uh, this this African American woman was like you know if this, if this is a work related thing not to rely on those people in your organization to to inform you necessarily about about race or about you know being a, a Muslim in this country but to hire people that are trained and you're a consultant what do you think about that I think that has value. Uh, particularly uh, with topics that are difficult, which race is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it's helpful to have a person who has skill in navigating uh, conversations to, to be a part of, part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and when we say hire someone, I specifically am intending, because we w uh, talked about <laughs> the white privileged guy, right, who was yeah. going to these universities. Yeah. And I, I would I would say that I'm, you know, it's a mixed bag. Can a person who's who's a male talk deeply about with training about discrimination along gender lines for being a woman? Like I would encourage, you know, um, those to look for these experts that possibly are of the same race or, or have lived in the shoes of the very people that they um, are representing or giving voice to. 
I like to think that you have more than one person in a setting like that so that mm -hmm. you can get more than one uh, way of looking at things. So friends of mine that uh, run executive diversity services, for example, um, have worked as a husband and wife team, mm -hmm. and, and, but have other very diverse people, staff on, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I think, I think uh, and they're a husband and wife team, uh, uh, Irish American and uh, African American. Okay, so they cover it. It's like the one-two punch thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any closing remarks or thoughts, Bob, before we close it out? So, white folks, do you do you have do you have a good friend who's of a different color? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just a friend, friend. I'm talking about somebody that's really close. And I'm, and do you have do you, do you include those people in your life in different dimensions? Mm -hmm. And do you go to church with people that are different than you mm -hmm. and do you seek out people who have different viewpoints mm -hmm. and um if not why not yeah and is it because of fear we just don't have time will be a common answer mm -hmm. but hey it's a, it's a rich world out there it is, and, and I love that you say that. And one, one thing is, like, have I invited someone to my home? And you said a friend. Everybody, you know, jokes, not everybody, but there's, you know, certain crowds that'll laugh about the one token that's mm -hmm. like your get-out-of-free jail, uh, right. get-out-of-jail-free card. You right. know, I have a friend. There you go. And and I think uh, another litmus test in addition to have I had or do I have a friend is have has that friend or have friends that do not look like me invited me over to their home? Yeah. Because that's... That takes it to the next level That's a where they street. exactly where they feel comfortable enough with you to want to invite you into their world and mm -hmm. their space and their home as well. So I think those are great litmus tests to to have some self reflection with. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a litmus test that you know because we can all have prejudice uh, and bias. And so I, I think for our listeners that are are not white, it's also a still it's still a good inquiry of do I have friends that don't look like me or maybe don't believe the same faith that I believe um, have I been invited to their homes if I do have that friend and vice versa uh, so I, I think that's a, a bit of reflection that we could all take home and just see if there's any blind spots that that may um, surface from that reflection Bob it has been such a treat to have you today I just thank you very much for the opportunity uh, you know, I think it's it made me nervous to be invited, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's uh, I think it's, it's a tough topic and one that we need to spend more time on for sure. Absolutely. Well, we'll get some more opportunities, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Feel Good the podcast. This episode is dedicated to the many human beings that have experienced being treated inhumanely in this country. Um, usually based off of the color of their skin um, and gender. And most recently, you know, there's a long list of names uh, that could be mentioned and honor in a lot of different groups um, that, that are all welcomed into this. And most recently, I just want to mention and speak the name of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor among the many others who have lost their lives um, based on, you know, factors that they were born with and not based on the content of their character. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe, we'd love that. Share with a friend. Uh, and most importantly, if you are inspired to take an action, to be curious about a group of people that you don't know much about, um, and to, you know, build that bridge and recognizing the humanity in those that don't look like you. That's the best compliment that you could give us. So do with that what you will. I also want to give a big shout out to those who have supported this work financially. Q Law, Judy Z. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you would like to become more engaged in what we're doing and what we're up to uh, by making a financial pledge, please go to our patreon.com slash feelgood page where you can become a member and have access to additional perks and content. 